Hello, everyone. I hope you are well today, wherever you are around this uh, battered up planet that we are currently living in. It's really nice to be able to spend some time with you. My name is George Strombolopoulos, and welcome to Cultivated Meat, No Longer Science Fiction. This is a flagship panel series, and as you've seen in that little video clip off the top, there's a, a lot of ground to cover. That was a little primer. Some of it we will expand upon in our conversation today. We shall escape the absurdity. That quote right off the top is kind of where we begin with this one here. This is a good time for this conversation as well, because by the time we're done with it, uh, you'll be able to learn more when the film actually screams April the 5th, the release of the award-winning documentary called Meet the Future. I really encourage you to stick around afterwards as well, not just for the screening, but you'll also uh, get introduced to the writer and director Liz Marshall. To get you set for this conversation and a really interesting panel of people, take a look at the trailer of Meet the Future. This is the story of planetary hope, inspired by one of the biggest ideas of the century. This has been something that I've been dreaming about since I was a kid. My whole life, all I wanted to do was be a chef, and I wanted to focus on meat. My training is in biomedical engineering. I was actually a tissue engineer. I took an urban agriculture class that really opened my eyes to what we were doing to the planet just by feeding ourselves. We want to separate the animal from meat making. The division cycle of the cell rather than the reproductive cycle of the animal. And this is a huge, huge paradigm shift. These small tissue samples will produce extremely large amounts of meat. From the consumer perspective, we're facing a brave new world. Technology that was once the stuff of science fiction and now becoming a reality. There's a lot of fear around the intersection of food and technology. The manufacturers of lab-grown products should be required to invest in their own market and not ride the coattails of beef's success. Right now is a make or break moment for clean meat. I am signing a letter with the largest meat trade association of the world. Felt like the right thing to do. We are going to bring everybody under this tent. With meat consumption expected to double by 2050, we urgently need solutions. Welcome to the next agricultural revolution. I just want to make sure you're looking at this as a very big historic thing in this world. That is neat. So there's the trailer for Meet the Future. More on that uh, throughout the conversation. And of course, at the end, when you meet the writer and director, Liz Marshall, uh, everybody who is on the panel today has played and continues to play a significant role in shaping not just the conversation, but shaping the product, shaping what it is uh, that we are going to be talking about today. I know that a lot of people are excited about technological innovation, most certainly. And when we've posted this all throughout the social media world, the comments have been really interesting, really amazing, really strange, because it's a very, very question and series of questions that we'll be exploring today. Let me run through who is going to be on the panel today so that you'll know. Uh, to the Netherlands we go. Ira van Eylen is here, a designer with a history of working in all kinds of design, healthcare, ICT, but also has a passion for cultivated meat. Cultivated meat. This is also a legacy for her, uh, for her because her father, uh, Willem van Eylen, the late Willem, is um, the godfather of cultivated meat, really. And so a lot of this is her lifeblood and part of her story. So I'm really looking forward to, to speaking with her today. Uh, and also we have Isha Dittar, who's in Edmonton uh, right now in Canada. And Isha is the executive director of New Harvest. Uh, this has been uh, a big part of your life as well. You've been pioneering in the field of cellular agriculture for a while, uh, published many, many years ago uh, on the subject back in 2010 as well possibilities 
for an meat production system. So there's a lot to get into there. Uh, you saw the good doctor in the trailer there, Uma Valetti. Uh, this is, uh, this is of course, an enormous part of your life. Uh, a cardiologist, now the CEO and founder of Upside Foods, which was known as Memphis Meats, the world's leading company in producing meat directly from animal cells. So no doubt a lot of this will be centered on you. And uh, you are in Austin right now, though you're West Coast based in Austin for South by. And to DC, Jessica Almy, Vice President of uh, Policy for the Good Food Institute, an international nonprofit, which is reimagining meat production. Lots of members all across the United States and in uh, affiliate offices as well. Uh, it is nice to be with all of you today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, following along in the chat and the way people relate. You know this is passionate for people. Food is political, food is spiritual, food is emotional, food is all these things. And when you make food scientific, it becomes even more, um, well, it opens up a real big can there for people to engage in. The nomenclature around cultivated meat in and of itself has changed dramatically over the years from using words like pure, to cultured. Broadly, now we accept the term cultivated meat. Uh, it, Isha, let's just start with you. What is cultivated meat exactly? So we can bring people into the conversation who may not know. Sure. Um, so cultivated meat or cultured meat or clean meat or whatever you want to call it is a meat that is grown directly from cells from animals. So rather than collecting your meat from a slaughtered animal, you would just collect a biopsy of cells and multiply those cells outside of an animal's body and hopefully arrive at a product very similar to the meat that you and I are so familiar with. Is it food? I would absolutely say it's food. I mean, most of the things that we eat are living except for salt. Um, so uh, eating cell cultures to me is just one step beyond eating animals, eating plants, eating microorganisms through brewing processes and fermentation processes. Why not eating animal cells directly? Dr. Valetti, we saw that in the opening uh, to our time together today, that this is something you've been dreaming out about. Talk about this as food and where we are now with cultivated meat and it as food. Yeah, thanks, George. This has been something that I've been dreaming about since I was a kid and specifically probably around eight or nine years old when I loved to eat meat, but um, later on recognized how how challenging it is to bring meat to the table and uh, kept eating it for a while. But that's kind of when I started thinking about what if and what if we could make something that is really the most delicious and the most desired um, food across the world in a way that doesn't have downsides. And that's a thought that kept coming back to me and um, never thought that I would start a company in this space, not even get involved in any of the science behind it. And it all started off with uh, the early experiences as a kid and then later on in medical school when I saw how very large scale animal agriculture is done. And I recognized that it was done with the intent of feeding people who have asked for more of it and more of it and more of it and the minute a family has some extra income the first thing they do is to buy something good for them that is delicious so um while i had no uh uh you know idea of how we could do this i mean i was thinking early days what if meat can grow from trees and that seemed ridiculous and it still is maybe in the future we could do that but my path to cardiology at the mayo clinic is really what led me to think about this um, as a field that is possible. And that's because of the work we do in medicine, where we take cells from, you know, you know, stem cells, and I was injecting them into patients' hearts to regrow their heart muscle when they had a heart attack or a cardiac arrest. And that's really where this idea came from, where if, if we can grow meat from animal cells, that would definitely solve many problems. One is obviously, not having the enormous animal welfare impact or environmental impact. But then I was very excited on top of that also for making meat better. What does it look like if you can make meat better, which is healthier and maybe not associated with some of the chronic diseases, uh, some of the processed meats are associated with. So one thing led to another and I decided to start a basic science lab in the space. And that's when I got um, to know Isha really well. And Isha was just starting uh, at New Harvest. And uh, it became a, I think for the last 10 years, Isha and I, have, I've, we've seen the evolution of this field 
And the analogy I can think of when you say, is this food, right? We want to think about our food as very idyllic, you know, cows and pastures eating grass and grass fed. And while that is great, the majority of the food doesn't come to the plate that way. And if I think about this movement, cultivated meat, you know, from the early days from, you know, Iris' dad, um, as well as Isha and me and, and, and the Good Food Institute and many others, there's lots of companies in this space now. It seems like a grassroots movement that's been built for the last 90 years from the original quote you read, right? 1932 from Winston Churchill. It's been a grassroots movement that's been building up, but I think it's time has come. And the magical moment really is recognizing that it is food. And how do we recognize something as food? It is when we eat it. You know, you have to be able to taste it to recognize that this is the meat that we've loved, all the senses that that just light up when you bite in a, on a, in a piece of meat should happen when you eat it. And that's really what happens with a really good piece of cultivated meat. And I'm hoping that that's the experience that people can start having in the years to come. You know, one of the, one of the reasons why we're doing this is, is, is certainly in this opening segment is to demystify this, the conversation around it, because uh, for people who are at the leading edge of this or, or interested in science and tech, of course, this is something that has been thought about for a while. But for other people, this is this is a there's there are some barriers psychologically to get into these kinds of conversations to try. And also, you're, you're right about what is food, because we often eat things that many people wouldn't describe as food now in our current culture. Um, we eat ingredients and we eat a lot of we eat a lot of process. Um, um, but as we walk through some of the early stages in this conversation about what is cultivated meat and your reasons for getting into it, there we open a whole host of questions here. We can't answer them all in the time we have together. The film itself answers plenty, won't answer them all as, as you talked about. This is an ongoing conversation and, and its time has clearly arrived. One of the things that we hear a lot about are the ethics of food. We know the political impact of food, food used as a weapon, how not everybody has access to the fa same food, uh, but the ethical nature of uh, eating meat has been brought, well, it's been talked about a lot for a lot of people for many, many years. You know, Ira, when you think about, Ira, when you think about this as ethical, you grew up in the early stages of this conversation with your father. Talk about this and the ethical aspect of cultivated meat. Well, the ethical aspect of this is very simple. Um, cultured meat is not only to feed the people in the, of the future, it's to feed the people of today. And if we can do that in a more efficient way, uh, we're not taking away food from too many people. We're actually uh, uh, creating food that everybody loves to eat. And that won't take away the grain uh, uh, that we otherwise feed into animals. It's more efficient. So therefore, in that way, towards food and feeding everybody uh, ethical in itself. Um, if that is a question to, uh, or an answer to your question, um, the most difficult thing has been for me. Uh, I started explaining what cultivated meat was when I was 14, and that was a long, long time ago. Uh, people just uh, asked me um, when I started eating cultivated meat not so long ago, uh, sadly enough, what does it taste like? And they assume it tastes like something else because they can't imagine that you can actually do this. Uh, but once people start believing it is possible and when they eat it, um, they're overwhelmed and they're happy about it and they suddenly can give in to the bad feeling that they have around eating feed, uh, meat as they do today. So um, for a lot of people, the ethical sphere around eating meat is difficult, but they put it aside because they love meat so much. Well, I think it's great when they can just uh, eat it, enjoy it, and not feel bad about it anymore. You know, Jessica, as we have these conversations about food, food supply, but also about innovation, one of the things that usually happens is a whole series of roadblocks appear. They are often from competitors, they're often from old technology, they're often from government regulation. You work with regulation, legislation, and trying to get people to understand how to do this in a just way, in, an, in a way that's equitable for everyone. Talk about this uh, from that perspective. Yeah, I think it's really critically important that there be a level playing field for cultivated meat as it comes to market in the United States and in countries around the world. I mean, Ira was talking about the different benefits that consumers 
find with this product. You know, it, I think in addition, if we're successful, it's going to be as delicious or more delicious than conventional meat at um, the same price or less. So making sure that governments are not erecting barriers that pre either prevent it from coming to market altogether or make it unnecessarily expensive or inaccessible to people is critically important. And so there are really two components of that. One is, you know, can it come to market and can it be sold um, truthfully labeled? And we're seeing that Singapore is allowing that to happen. And the United States is making progress with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and FDA coming together. When you say, to truthfully, when you say tr truthfully labeled, talk about truthfully labeled and why that's important. So it's important that consumers understand what they're buying. And here, what's most important is that consumers understand this is real animal meat. It's made from animal cells. So if a consumer has an allergy to the conventional version of something, whether it's a conventional seafood or there are consumers with allergies to red meat, they need to know that they will likely have the same allergic reaction to this. So using meat and fish terms on the labels is important to truthfully convey to consumers what this is. At the beginning, companies will have every incentive to also tell consumers how it's made because it's a significant advantage. You know, this is made with a lower environmental impact. There is no animal slaughter. This is made in a more efficient way that uses the Earth's resources more equitably. So companies will be telling consumers this is cultivated meat. This is meat made from cultivated animal cells. Um, but what we can't allow is for governments to either prohibit meat and seafood terms altogether, which puts consumers with allergies at risk and is not truthful, nor compel terms that are off-putting to consumers in an attempt to protect one kind of industry and prevent competition. So it's really important that these be truthfully labeled. Um, the other piece of it, though, is that governments also need to invest in this kind of meat production the same way that we invest in renewable energy because we see the climate crisis and we understand that humans need energy to live a modern life. Most people also want to eat meat to live a modern life. And meat has a significant contribution to climate change. So it's incumbent on governments to fund research and to provide incentives to companies to allow this kind of meat production to not only come to market, but also to flourish and to provide the world's protein as the world grows and demands more and more meat. You know, we, we sort of acknowledge that we live in a version of crony capitalism in many parts of the world, as opposed to a pure capitalism in a pure free market. And so, when you have crony capitalism, you have an awful lot of people who, as you had alluded to, don't want this to happen because it's, it, you know, it'll take away their piece of the pie. So when you start to talk to lawmakers and, and, you know, we'll talk to Liz a little bit later about this, you see it appear in the film. How do you get people to see that this is actually the way forward um, and get governments to be leaders in this? I think it's a critically important question. I mean, if the United States doesn't invest right now, you know, right now, the United States is the leader in, in this space. We have the most companies in the United States. We have the most innovative companies. Look at what Uma and his colleagues are doing, among others. Um, but the United States stands to lose its competitive advantage if it doesn't make these investments now. The same way that we saw, you know, um, solar panels go to China and batteries for electric vehicles go to China. We are at risk, the United States, but also Canada, the Netherlands, the EU, at, are at risk of falling behind if we don't invest in this kind of technology. And the time to do it is now, because it's critically important to um, you know, address the climate crisis and ensure that we're fulfilling our commitments under the Paris Agreement, but also to make sure we can feed everybody. This is a food security issue. The world is growing and is demanding more and more meat. So by 2050, 70 to 100 percent more meat will have to be produced than is now. And we simply just don't have the land or the resources to grow it the way we're doing. So even if you think you will never eat this, it's critically important that this be available on the market for 
everyone to have access to so that the people who do want to eat this kind of meat can eat a more efficient, um, better kind of meat that eases up the kind of um, global impact that growing meat production kind of under the status quo would have. Um, so that's critically important. And of course, every dollar invested in agricultural research like this um, yields tremendous economic benefits too. So even if we just want to grow the economy, this is a critically important way to do it. We can talk about viability and, and, and alternatives as, as we go on. And thank you for that, uh, Jessica. Um, I think as, as, as we establish this too, all of you have, as we said at the outset, you have long runs in this field and are and are, and are experts in this field. Uh, each, I think, cellular agriculture is a phrase you coined. So I'd like to to know a little bit more about how, what your historical markers were and how you got into this. Why don't we start with you, Isha? Sure, that's an awesome question. Um, so historical markers, that's a great question. Um, so I got into this field as a undergraduate student who was doing a just science degree and decided to take a meat science class because I thought, you know, I'm doing a bio degree. Why am I not learning about food? Food is bio, food is life. So I learned all about um, the problems of animal agriculture actually in my very first class and was kind of stunned that we had focused so much of our energy around, you know, environmentalism and helping the planet around industry and fossil fuels and all this kind of thing when animal agriculture is kind of right in front of us all this time. And in some ways, one could argue it's a lot easier to change animal agriculture than change all the, you know, road infrastructure in cities, you know, change Los Angeles where you are, George, like, when's that going to happen? Um, so instead, it's this idea that if we change the way meat comes to our plate, um, we could actually solve a lot of problems at the same time, animal welfare issues, um, lots of public health issues associated with all of the epidemic viruses that come out of animal agriculture. And of course, uh, all the greenhouse gas emissions that come out of animal agriculture as well. Methane in particular is a very potent greenhouse gas that comes from animals. Um, so I just got so obsessed with this idea of growing meat from cells that I wrote the paper that you mentioned earlier, um, and that was published in 2010. And I became executive director of New Harvest in January of 2013. And I was the only person who worked at this organization for quite a long time. And I remember thinking to myself, how am I and my laptop going to make cell cultured meat exist in the world? <laughs> um, I'm like, you know, just some person in the world. Um, and I was very much inspired by Carl Sagan. He has a quote where he says, if you wanna make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. And so I realized it had nothing to do with multiplying cells in the lab and everything to do with creating this universe. So who are all the people that need to come together to care about this and make it happen? Where is all the money going to come from? What kind of knowledge do we need? How do we create this bigger ecosystem that makes cell cultured meat possible? And the naming of cellular agriculture came from the realization that growing meat from cells was really just one facet of moving away from animal agriculture. You know, we could grow milk proteins from cells. We could grow egg proteins from cells. We can really grow any product that we get from the natural world from cells if we want to. I mean, another great example outside of animals is vanilla. You know, we could grow vanilla in cell cultures and not have to rainforest farm it or rely on the kind of petrochemical substitution that we're used to. So cellular agriculture was really naming that this was a field of study. It wasn't just a product or, you know, one thing we were imagining on one person's plate. It was actually an, an entire field of study. We need institutes of cellular agriculture. We need uh, students to be able to pursue, oh, that's the thing I want to study in school. Um, and so another big milestone for me was kind of going on to create a couple of startups that I think were the earliest really in the field that focused on producing foods from cell cultures. So one is called Perfect Day Foods, making milk proteins in cell culture, and they have ice cream and cream cheese and all this kind of stuff on the market right now. And another was called Clara Foods, now called The Every Company that is working on egg proteins. And I really feel like founding these, or co-founding these two companies in early 2014 helped spark um, this kind of expansion 
of the field afterwards because people realized it wasn't just you know science fiction it wasn't just an idea it was something that really could be done in the physical world we just needed to dedicate mm -hmm. our time and energy to it so there's a lot of more milestones after that i don't even know where to stop but when i will the though. one yeah i'll say one more milestone if that's okay um we after we started those companies we realized we needed to really build out this like institute infrastructure how do we really create that pipeline for students so we started funding academic researchers we were really the first to, to do that in a very methodical way, funding several researchers at once. And uh, just last year, one of our grantees received a $10 million grant to start the first National Institute for Cellular Agriculture at Tufts University. So for me, that's an incredible milestone for the field. Like it's great celebrating the startups, but we got to celebrate all these other parts of the ecosystem and the cell ag universe as well. Just so, thank you very much. Just over your left shoulder from Edmonton to uh, Amsterdam, we go, uh, you know, uh, Eero, we've talked about obviously you coming to this, seeing your father's work in this early, but uh, some historical markers for you. I think we have, uh, we've got a frozen internet. Uh, so Uma, we talked to you about uh, about how you first got involved in this, but when did you start to get a sense that this was actually something you could do, that there was a viability to this as business? It still seems insane. All right. So to be <laughs> candid, it still seems insane. <laughs> this is not easy to do. Uh, this is going to require uh, a lot of change in many things that we take for granted. So I'd say the instinct of this daunting, needing to be a business was uh, right after I finished at the Mayo Clinic. So that's when the idea came around 2005. And uh, later on, I was in practice between uh, 2005 and 2015, practicing cardiology in the Twin Cities. Uh, and that's when I started increasingly thinking, you know, I could do this in academia and start a basic science lab, but that would be mostly focused on the science and, and, and grants and papers. And while that was interesting, and I did start a basic science lab, uh, I was at the same time also involved in other companies. I had started a couple of medical device companies and I was investing in a lot of companies in the space of animal, uh, in, in, the same, in, the, in the space of alternatives to animal agriculture. And that's when the idea really came. I should probably encourage other people to start more companies in the space. And I wasn't thinking of doing it myself. so. I remember talking to um, a lot of people, uh, asking them to start companies in this space, specifically to grow meat from animal cells, because I cared about that part deeply. And I could not convince anyone. Um, and everyone was excited about it, but we're very happy to have them uh, as university-based projects. And that was when I felt like this is a high-risk area and asking people who are well-established in their careers, you know, like me or others who were able to start university labs, was not going to be easy. And uh, I remember talking to Isha a fair amount and also to uh, Bruce at Goodfoot Institute. And, uh, you know, for me, a big milestone in my life was, you know, when my wife and kids said, why are you not doing it, right? So that was a pretty, pretty big moment. And finally, you know, it was a very easy answer. Yes, you know, if I really believed in it and if I really wanted to see this exist, why am I asking others to take that risk? So that became a really pivotal moment in my life and having having uh, our family support was uh, meant everything. So that led to, you know, the next steps of trying to actually start a company. You know, we were the first company in the space and uh, um, people laughed at us. You know, nearly everybody who I spoke to, except I can tell you on a handful, um, are the only ones who said, don't look back, Uma. This is how every journey starts at one step in front of the other. And it still seems insane. Look, I think I can imagine how it felt for people who were talking about, you know, electric cars, like two decades ago, felt insane. And probably now people talking about autonomous driving felt insane. And people talking about cryptocurrency felt insane, right? I mean, there's big systemic changes that have to happen. And a lot of people have to work on this area. So, you know, starting off from academia, government policy, funding, investors, and some people have to go out there into the arena and start actually making it. And the making it mm -hmm. part is the hardest part, right? And I think that's really where with Memphis Meats initially and Upside Foods, our team has taken a lot of punches. You no, know, not 
everything is straightforward. There is no playbook. And you are writing the playbook as you go. And sometimes you have to keep changing direction. And one of the good examples on the consumer side is the name has evolved from what it was to what it is now, but it took time to figure that out. And, you know, I can think of the industries, the biggest milestone for the industry is we are actually putting a very delicious meat products that did not have to require raising an animal on the plate and people are not able to tell the difference. And that, that was all theoretical and now it's, it's made and we can show that. So I think, you know, looking at all of that, it just feels like, you know, it still seems insane that we can have the amount of production that is required for us to even have a, a, a small impact. But that phase is beginning now. The last five years was showing that the science works and we can make really delicious products and we can make them at a reasonable scale. So thousands of people can come and you know, experience it. But the next five years is all about trying to see, can we make millions of pounds and have millions of people taste it? And that's another steep hill. That's what we're getting ready, ready to climb now. We'll get and yeah, we'll, we'll get into the viability conversation next, Jessica. You you're no stranger to working in the idea of science uh, in the public interest, and and as, as big a challenge as what Doctor's saying about getting this stuff, to making it. Another enormous challenge is making sure that it's the right thing to do. I one of the we you know I'm a vegan, so I haven't eaten meat in many 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 years. So I, that's why I was really interested in watching this film and, and, and having this conversation with mm. you because it raises questions for myself about why am I, what did I do um, and, and my reasons for doing what I do. But one of the things that I found really fascinating is, wow, we will go to great lengths and spend a lot of money and, and build machines and go to great lengths reimagining an industry when all people have to do is not eat as much meat. And, and that money spent in research could be going to fighting things like you know, poverty and other stuff. Now, and Isha, I like what you said earlier about how it's not just about this. It's what this, the doors that this opens up. But these are conversations you've had a lot, Jessica, I'm sure over the course of your career in science and public interest. Where are your historical markers to get involved? Yeah, so uh, this is such a great conversation. I think the themes that you're raising around um, what your veganism means to you and why other people just can't give up meat are really important questions to have. So prior to coming to the Good Food Institute nearly five years ago, I was working for um, a policy nonprofit called the Center for Science and the Public Interest. And as part of my work there, I did um, a literature review about why people make the food decisions they make. It's so funny because I, I had all these ideas. I thought that I personally knew why people made certain food choices. But the reality is when you actually look at the science that, that the brain is interesting. It works in two different tracks. So there's the kind of thoughtful, deliberate part of your brain, which is the part that decides to eat you know, your black beans and brown rice and a side of kale. And then there's the other side of your brain, which is impulsive, which doesn't actually go through the same process for making decisions. And it turns out that so many food choices we make are made by that quick part of our brain, the brain that just part of the brain that just grabs the candy bar from the supermarket checkout before we've even made the decision that we want to buy a candy bar. And maybe against our better judgment, maybe against the New Year's resolution that we made just weeks prior. Um, and it's aggravated by people living in poverty by people having to make countless choices during the day, you make a lot of choices, and then it's much harder to make a rational or, you know, kind of um, a decision that requires a lot of willpower. And so I realized we can tell people how to eat. We can tell people you should eat less meat for the planet, for the animals, for the global poor, for your own health, for all of these reasons, keep antibiotics working. But the reality is it's not going to work. People have been talking about vegetarianism and veganism for a very long time. And, um, you know, the numbers have not significantly grown. What has grown is the amount of meat that Americans and people around the world are consuming. And so we can't, we're not really very effective if we try to change people's minds about what food is. What we have to do is change the food and change the system. And what I love about cultivated meat is it allows people to eat the meat that they love. Uma spoke really eloquently about loving to eat meat when he was growing up. And yet having these 
you know, conflicting feelings about it as he became more knowledgeable about where that meat was coming from. Um, Half of Americans want to outlaw slaughterhouses, but half of Americans are not vegetarian. We can have meat without slaughter. We can have cultivated meat that's grown directly from cells in a tank called a cultivator. And that's a, an amazing way to allow people to both have the meat they love and live their values and have a lighter impact on the, the rest of the planet, you know, the, the earth, the other inhabitants on it, both human and non-human. So uh, George, I hope you will eat cultivated meat as a vegan. I think never before have people had the choice to eat meat without slaughter, but right now we do. And I, and I imagine a world, this isn't for vegans, by the way, it's kind of, you know, it's for everybody. It's mostly for people who are not vegans, but we can have diets that are predominantly plant-based foods and maybe have a little bit of precision fermentation like Isha was talking about, you know, dairy made without the cow and also can have meat that's made without um, the regular process that has a much lighter impact and doesn't involve slaughter at all. Well, you know, there's, there's that bravery of being at a range thing. Lots of people want things and aren't willing to do the things they're supposed to do to to affect the change, which is probably why the slaughterhouse conversation is interesting. And look, yeah, I, again, I, I love how it, conflicting this is. Um, and everybody has their own reason for eating the way they eat, as you know. A big part of it is driven by gut health. A big part of it is, as you know, by marketing and SEOs and how, how the industry reaches us and tells us what food is. But what I, th- what I also think is like down the road, many, many years from now, this kind of conversation won't even be happening because we'll have already moved. This is so early that as uh, it, that's why it seems so complicated. That's why the comments are so in, uh, on social media as we roll through this conversation today and the messages I'm getting about it. Everybody's trying to figure out how to feel about this because it is so new. The question that I have straight up is the viability of it. I know a big part of your film uh, uh, deals with cost per pound and cost per ounce and how much are you going to do this how can you get more people to have access to it how do you do it i I, you know we talked earlier about getting the governments to be involved but why would the governments get involved in building up business that in the end like what are the reasons for all of this to happen so let's just flat out the viability you know uma where is the you know let's focus on the us which is where you are right now where is the state of the industry right now and where is it globally yeah, look, great question. Look, I have, I'm, I'll say upfront, I have no doubt that this industry has a very strong chance at viability and have a very, very high conviction. And there is a few things that will need to come together for it, which is we will have to find a way to incentivize change. And that incentivizing change can come from many, many, many stakeholders. And uh, part of it is going to be the uh, policymakers and the governments and investors and also the general public who's going to have to ask for it. And the only way for any of these to start is there's got to be an opening. And the opening starts with the regulatory approval that we can actually legally sell a product so consumers can come and taste it and they can go to a restaurant and order it. So I think that's the opening. And then once you have that, you're going to have to introduce that at a price that a consumer feels comfortable paying. And we know that it's very expensive to make it and it's getting better and better from the day we've started working on it it's come down a thousand fold. And I think it has to come another tenfold down to be able to say it sounds like it's a premium organic product. But when we put it in front of consumers, it's going to have to be in the range of what they're used to paying, maybe at a uh, high-end grocery store or a high-end restaurant. So that's probably more expensive than organic. That's kind of what I'm, I'm predicting. And that's what we are targeting as a company. But I also know talking to a lot of other founders and companies in this space, that's really what they're targeting too. I mean, they do have aspirations to get to the parity of pricing of conventional meat. That's going to take time. That may, it, that may take 10 years or more. And I think that's fine because you have to start innovation like this by showing the viability first. And I'd say categorically in the last five years, people in the industry have shown it is viable to make meat without slaughter. And it is also viable to put it at reasonable prices in front of people. As I know that many people manufacturing uh, 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 conventional, uh, uh, sorry, cultivated meat already can say they're not the most expensive meats in the world because there are some really expensive meats in the world. So that proves another level of viability. And if you look at the time frame, so George, this all happened in six years. Yeah. Right. There has never been any innovation that kind of starts off and in six years, a few things happen. One is 
enormous interest develops in among multiple stakeholders. And here it's happened that way. There is enormous amount of interest in academia. It's a lot of interest in investors to get the thing started. But then there's a lot of interest among media, right? Any type of media it could be catering to general public. It could be catering to very techn technology savvy, uh, you know, audience, or it could be for a political audience or a regulatory audience. All of them have been very interested and governments have gotten excited and started actually approving products. Again, in the history of food, this has never happened. Like in, in a span of six years to get to regulatory approval and start selling products and having a hundred companies in this space, having undergraduate and postgraduate teaching programs uh, happen in multiple universities that are top universities in the world. These have never happened. So we can't say this is not viable because it's just getting started. I, I, yeah, I think, I think this is, it's fascinating to be a part of these conversations and see what you're doing at this stage because of how much it's grown in such a short order. What I really like about it too, is that it forces people to challenge, we said their own stuff, but it also forces countries to challenge themselves and see what other countries are doing. Uh, arrows back. So the European union, the, the, the European context, you know, we all know that every country and every region of the world has their own realities. Um, how is this playing out there? What is the headway there? Well, yesterday was a great day. Uh, a lot of things happened at once uh, on the same day. Uh, there was an APEC, so uh, Asian Pacific, they have now a consortium of people or an alliance working on cultivated meat. But at the same day, I was invited uh, in London to uh, Parliament to be part of the introduction of an alliance of alternative protein people. And it was a big show of a lot of people I know, but also new people, students, government officials, uh, right in the House of Parliament. And at the same day in the Netherlands, there was a vote on whether it's allowed to eat or try cultivated meat within the companies to do actual tastings. And uh, out of the 150 people in our parliament, 121 voted in favor of that, and not everybody was in the house. So that's a good sign. And that was something that would not have happened two years ago. And um, in Europe, I've said many times ago, we have a sort of legislation that makes Europe uh, maybe an island or a sort of museum. Uh, but the UK is now charging uh, up to say, hey, after Brexit, we must do something uh, good. And uh, uh, Brexit is really on this topic now challenging Europe, like, hey, we're going to make some legislation that is going to be used and useful all around the world. And then, of course, Europe will have to follow. It can't stay within their own context of we know best and uh, uh, how we do it is how the rest of the world should do it. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about it. So even though I'm from Europe, I'm in the Netherlands, I should be happy about the laws that we have. I think they're well meant, but they're not uh, very efficient at this moment and in this moment uh, of time, because it's nice to have laws and legislation that is supposed to make me feel safe, or to actually keep me safe. But if it becomes a hurdle to something that could even make the world a safer place, then it's actually really unsafe. So that there's work on this. And a day like yesterday, that is for me um, something I could not have imagined 20 years ago. And um, only because of the work that Isha did and what Uma did and now the film coming out, the sliding panels are sliding so much faster than they did the 20, 30 years before. So, yeah, um, I am, I'm actually not that worried about it. And uh, people are taking lead in this. Thank you for that. Um, and it's, it's good to have you back. Uh, uh, Jessica, the regulatory hurdles that, that the era referred to are, are real, certainly, and they're different in different regions. What are some of the more direct ones that you think we need to jump across and that those hurdles then just become dominoes? Uh, and it becomes easier to make this happen. Yeah, well, Singapore has certainly led the way. This, pro you know, cultivated chicken is being sold in Singapore today. Um, it's the first country in the world. So they're certainly a leader. The United States 
has made significant progress, you know, working in conjunction with companies like UMA's um, that are demonstrating the safety of their process and the safety of their products. Um, I'm really heartened to see also countries like Israel really embracing this technology where you have heads of state eating cultivated meat for the first time. The state of New Jersey here in the United States, I'm sorry, Connecticut, sorry, sorry, Connecticut. Um, the governor recently was in Israel and, and tried cultivated meat um, as part of a kind of a tour to try to get Israeli companies to, to set up shop in, in Connecticut. So there's a lot of signs of hope, but I think what makes me most excited is that the United Nations um, and what's called the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which is the food code that almost every country in the world participates in, they're starting to make, do work on this topic. So they've actually convened a, a working group um, and have put out a, what they call a circular letter to get input from countries around the world about how to regulate these products. And the idea is to ensure harmonization to keep consumers safe and to reduce the barriers to trade. And it's hugely influential for low and middle income countries. So to have an entity like that really addressing these issues head on tells you where we are at this moment in time. This is not just, you know, uh, high income countries like the United States or, or the uh, countries of the European Union. This is really a global issue, and I think there's a lot of global excitement about it. So I'm really excited to see how things are progressing and kind of the um, global race to be the leader in this space is really exciting. You know, Isha, um, one of the challenges, I think, philosophically and also just in, in many levels is this can't stay exclusive for long. This can't stay high end for long if this is going to be for people. Right. And so there are, I'm sure there's lots of work that needs to be done in that area over time. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, that's a huge, huge question. And I think it ties to a lot of things. And while, you know, I actually kind of wanted to answer one of your earlier questions too, which was about viability. Like I, I absolutely think, that the science is viable, but we need to think about the ecosystem as a whole and what, how the ecosystem needs to be structured for, for cell ag and cell cultured meat to become the best versions of themselves. And, you know, when we, you asked also a question about, you know, why, why this like overcomplicated approach and we could all become vegan. And I mean, the, the real answer is because this has the weight of capitalism behind it. And so that's why it's able to grow and take off in a way that um, veganism can't or even regenerative agriculture can't. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that that has so much disruptive potential behind it. So if you can put to, towards this I, new idea of growing foods from cells without animals, and it has all this kind of power and momentum behind it, we need to make sure we're using that power to do ethical things along the way. And so not eating animals is not the only ethical decision we're going to have to make. We're also going to have to make decisions about access. We're probably going to have to make decisions about safety, speed to market, pricing. And those are like, I really want to encourage um, everyone to acknowledge that like we're six years in, there's maybe a hundred companies. That's a lot of power to the people who run those hundred companies and the leaders on this call to really make decisions about how do we make sure that um, we think about that stuff from the get-go? Because it's not going to just be about making the most products so it brings the price down. I think that's a an easy question, but I don't think, or an easy answer, but I don't think that's a real answer. Um, mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of complexity built into this, and we need to embrace embrace that right from the start. Absolutely. Okay, before, because we don't have a lot of time left, so I just want to throw it out. There's been a bunch of questions that have been kicked around and uh, uh, from audience, and I want to, to ask a few, and then someone can pipe in and answer them if you see fit. Nutritional profile. I think this is really important. We talk about safety. We talk about all that. Um, one of the reasons many people don't eat meat is because they don't think it's good for them in, in many respects. Uh, and there's lots of science to back up that thinking. So how do you change the nutritional profile? How do you make sure this is nutritional? Uma. Is that for me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, look, food has to be delicious. So there's so many things we eat now that are very delicious, right? And I think that's the first thing that anyone is going to look at. They have to enjoy food. And I think we can't compromise deliciousness. Otherwise, everybody would be eating, you know, things that are the most nutritionally dense, packed, most efficient foods. And that's, again, that's one of the another pipe dream. I think is, that's not going to happen. So then let's make sure that we ensure it's delicious. And then let's look and see what's nutritionally possible and what is not possible at the moment. So with meat, one thing I've been saying for more than a decade is let's not take for granted that what we eat now is the gold standard. Right. We've, we've just kind of been grandfathered. You know, we don't question how uh, something is made. If my mom cooks it or my grandma cooks it, I'm just going to eat it because I accept it for what it is. And I think those days are in the past. I think we should be able to say, can you make meat better? And how could you make it better? I think one is to try to make it um, with, you know, a lot more safety. Right. So right now, if you go back to reports in the last few years of consumer reports going and sampling, uh, meat meats in the grocery aisles, right? 70 to 90% have some level of bacterial contamination. There were some articles that just came out uh, about how difficult it is to decrease the levels of contamination because of the extent of slaughter that is associated with bringing meat to the table. I think that's the first thing we can do in making meat healthier, decrease the levels of contamination. The other things I would start thinking about is, can you start having you know beneficial fats in there, like omega-3s, versus omega-6s. Can you start having meats that typically are low in omega-3s to be higher in omega-3s? It doesn't matter which species it is. Make it, they could all be like maybe seafood or salmon, right? Those are the areas to explore. And then I would start thinking about, like there are things that are associated with chronic diseases or cancers or cardiovascular disease. And we still don't quite know what exactly the causative factor is. But as we start learning that, I think in cultivated meat, the opportunity exists to downregulate them or remove those factors or those proteins or their molecules to not even exist in the meat. So those are the things I think as I look about in the next two, three decades for health and nutrition should really come into play. Having said that, I, uh, I know yeah, no one's going to do that tasty. Yes, and we right. can, if we can add to that, that if we have more cultivated meat, we have a lot less antibiotics in our environment and that in itself is extremely healthy for everyone whether someone's a vegetarian a vegan or a meat eater so if we can at least achieve that we can st steer away from a pandemic make the whole world a lot more healthy and um, still have the meat that we like you know, one of the questions that we got asked, and it was funny because I, I don't know if it was somebody's rambunctious kid or a pet that made a noise back there, but this could act, <laughs> some people feed their pets better than they feed, than they worry about other people's nutritional profile. This could actually, using capitalism, Misha, revolutionize the pet <laughs> industry. It's a pet food game. Yes, that was my rambunctious kid who might okay. be making an appearance right now. But yes, the pet food thing is definitely a big part of it. And, <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Do you want to see this, Cole? Yeah, come say hello. <laughs> yeah, come say hello. Well, that's, uh, that's okay. the generation it's for, isn't it? Indeed. Anyway, pet food is a, is a huge opportunity for sure. And um, there are several companies that are working on this question. And interestingly, pet food has all kinds of different, you know, regulatory hurdles behind them. But... I think there's a lot of pet owners who would also would love to feed their pets better food than what they're feeding right now. I mean, the opportunity to feed your cat mouse um, instead of whatever cat food is made of would be awesome. Um, My cats the, are really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the um, the you know there's a lot of there's a lot of people who believe that part of the reason why healthy food is more expensive in respect than unhealthy food is because of who the governments choose to subsidize. And so what role is that going to play in here to bring costs down? Um, and we know that factory farm cattle gets lots of support in many different, um, in many different layers of government and, and corporations. Is that going to happen here? Uh, I'd love to jump in. I think, yes, you know, yeah, please. Uh, one of the leaders in this space in the U.S. Congress is Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut. 
And it's important that she's a leader because she also is one of the most powerful people in the House of Representatives because she heads up the Appropriations Committee, which holds the purse strings. And she has said that she would like alternative proteins, which is a broad category, which includes cultivated meat as well as plant-based meat, um, to have equal research funding to conventional ag animal agriculture. So I think what we're looking for is parity here. This should be treated exactly the same way that other kinds of meats are. And so if if a government in its wisdom decides that it wants to subsidize food, it wants to um, pay for research, it wants to bring down the cost for schools um, for a particular, you know, for meat, that should be equally available to cultivated meat. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica and Isha and Ira, really, and everybody who helped put this together. I want to bring on Uma, doctor. Thank you so much for all this. Um, let's bring on the uh, the filmmaker in question, uh, director, producer, uh, and the one who brought us all together, uh, long, my longtime friend, Liz Marshall. Hi, Liz. It's, uh, so, Liz, you know that not pe the people who are streaming us on Twitter won't get to see the film now, but the film April 5th is when the film gets released, right? you know, meet the future, you're going to introduce it to a certain group of people. T talk about that. Okay, great. Yeah, and you stay on screen with me. I, I love it. Um, so so basically, I want to first thank everyone. Thank you, George, my, my longtime friend. Thank you for doing this moderation. Um, and thank you to the panelists. Each of you are in the film, especially you, Uma, who I've known so well now for you know six years and it's been an adventure of a lifetime and it's truly been such a privilege as a filmmaker to witness the birth of an industry since 2016. Honestly, it's something, it's unforgettable. And we, I wanna thank the team that has helped put together this stellar event as well. Um, and we have one more flagship panel event on March 30th and you can sign up, it's free, it's virtual. Um, sign up from our website. That's meetthefuture.com. So it, it gives me great pleasure to be able to offer uh, to everyone who is registered um, to watch the film. This is a sneak peek uh, look at Meet the Future, uh, the international version of the film uh, that is having its release in the U.S. and select territories on April the 5th. And that is as part of Earth Month in April. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're very focused in the film and also in our campaign on the climate emergency and really the need for solutions, viable solutions. So, you know, enjoy the film and please follow us as part of the campaign. And I want to thank, I want to take this moment again just to thank Uma and your team and everyone on this panel and George mm -hmm. uh, for being part of this. Thank you. This is a story of planetary hope, inspired by one of the biggest ideas of the century. The fate of our planet may depend on a new food science that grows real meat directly from animal cells without the need to breed, raise, and slaughter animals. Let's face it, conventional animal agriculture is wreaking havoc. It occupies nearly half of the world's land, produces huge amounts of greenhouse gases, and is a potential breeding ground for health pandemics like COVID-19. With meat consumption expected to double by 2050, we urgently need solutions. Welcome to the next agricultural revolution.
you know, this is the first time a meatball has ever been cooked with beef cells that did not require a cow to be slaughtered.